You're listening to the RSA Conference podcast, where the world talks security. Hello, and welcome to our RSA Conference podcast. This is Britta Glade, Director of Content and Curation for RSA Conference, and I'm joined by Hugh Thompson, Program Chair for RSA Conference. Hello, Hugh. Hi, Britta, and hello, listeners. This month's theme of hackers and threats is one that intertwines so many of the tracks of RSA Conference 2020. It's privacy, it's the human element, it's product security, and there's several more that I could think about. In today's podcast, we're talking to two security professionals who are passionate about the threats of surveillance tools, particularly in spyware and stalkerware. They've been doing a lot of work independently as well as collaboratively to protect victims and their personal data from unwanted surveillance. David and Diana, could you please introduce yourselves? Thank you, Hugh. Uh, so my name, uh, like I said, is David Reese, and I am currently an online privacy writer for the cybersecurity company Malwarebytes. Uh, I've been with the company for a little under a year, working, again, primarily on online privacy and where privacy, uh, data privacy is meeting legislation, law, regulation. And I previously uh, worked at the digital rights nonprofit Electronic Frontier Foundation, where I worked on NSA surveillance, uh, how to protect us and how to protect our right to privacy. Fantastic. No, thanks so much, Diana. Let me turn it over to you. Sure. So I am a doctoral student at Cornell Tech, and I am a member of the IPV Tech Research Group, where our focus is on helping survivors of intimate partner violence. Great, Diana. Thanks so much for being here. And David, let me begin with you. you know, surveillance is actually this large umbrella topic. There's so many nuances to it. There's so many different applications that serve a variety of purposes. I wonder if, for our listeners, you could explain the different uses for surveillance, tracking, monitoring apps, and give us a better understanding of how and why they're used and how and why they're abused. If just an overview of that would be great. Yeah, of course. So like you said, um, surveillance is a huge umbrella, right? And it happens in many different ways and in many different sectors. And so when we're talking about apps, right, uh, apps or software that we see on our mobile devices or on our laptops and computers, there are some with different capabilities. Uh, there are some that are marketed for different purposes, uh, for different audiences. And from what I've seen, there are three sort of buckets uh, that we can kind of separate this into. First, there's digital workplace monitoring, right, um, what you do as an employee. Uh, the Guardian recently wrote about this. And they show that there are apps that can, for example, record your keystrokes. Uh, they can compile data on how often you're like switching between applications. So how often you're going from Word to Firefox to Outlook to Slack uh, over and over and over again. Uh, there was one piece of software that they looked at that even took photos of workers through their webcams. And when that was combined with other data, uh, that would be used to deliver what the company called a, a focus score or an intensity score. We also see it pretty common in any sort of industry where there's a lot of driving routes. Um, anyone who is driving to, let's say, hook up your internet or is delivering packages. Uh, there's software that tracks, again, the routes and also sometimes the speed of the workers who are constantly on the road. Uh, another area we see, another sort of second bucket, is parental monitoring. Right? These types of apps promise that their technologies can help protect a child from visiting risky websites or at least give parents a view into their children's online activity. And that can include like their Facebook posts, maybe even their text messages. Some also provide GPS tracking as well to locate a child or a child's device you know, when they're away from home. And then finally, there's this type of monitoring software that is actually advertised as, uh, you know, to use the company's kind of words, they see it as a solution to potential problems in romantic relationships. Uh, these are the types of apps that we're focusing on in today's discussion, and they're apps that tell users that, you know, with their tools, they're finally going to find out what their spouse is doing late at night. Uh, they're finally going to see who their partner is texting all the time. 
and they're finally going to find out, you know, are they really telling the truth when they say they're going to the gym? And they can find that out by relying and confirming a location with a GPS tracker. Uh, these apps can be pretty brazen in their marketing, too. There is one that, you know, after listing uh, some sort of stats about divorce, they say on the website that, oh, you know, technology can help detect and reveal infidelity. These are targeted in a way that, uh, again, they're seen as a solution, uh, a way to help you with your, your relationship problem. Um, but these apps can provide unfettered access into a person's mobile device. Um, and this is what we're talking about when, you know, this kind of access is abused. Um, it can reveal text messages, emails, GPS locations, browsing history, call logs. Uh, I want to emphasize how deeply invasive this information is when it leaves our control. And as a sort of small experiment, I looked at my own Google searches, like before this interview, for the past couple of days, and I'm not comfortable telling you any of my searches for a full day. And it isn't even just things that I search. It's not that I'm being protective of just my information. It's I'm protective of other people, right? If you looked at my searches, you could find out my dentist's name because I went to my dentist yesterday. And you could find out, you know, where my partner works because I picked her up at work over the weekend. This is like deeply unsettling stuff to have in another person's hand. So again, when we're looking at surveillance, uh, again, app-based surveillance, we're looking at workplace monitoring, parental monitoring, and again, this, this area of relationship monitoring. And between these apps, the lines do blur, and that's what makes this problem pretty difficult to address. There's a lot of layers. There's un unpacking some of that because you, you laid out very well all of the ram. Well, probably not even all. All the ramifications, the little breadcrumbs that very quickly become um, issues. So recognizing that tracking and monitoring tools, um, I'm going to go devil's advocate here because I have to, can also legitimately be used by parents, including um, this parent, who's been known to use Find My Friend to locate under 18 kids with their knowledge that maybe aren't home at curfew. It can be easy to blur the lines between monitoring and, and spying. Um, Diana, you have been a champion here with the development of a spyware scanning tool. Can you explain? explain to our listeners those important distinctions between a legitimate tool and spyware or soccerware and how perhaps a scanning tool could recognize those distinctions. Sure. So our research group at Cornell Tech developed the spyware scanning tool, um, particularly for people experiencing intimate partner violence. And what we did um, specifically with this tool was to identify apps that are off-store apps, spyware, um, such as mSpy, as well as tools that we call dual-use apps, so things like Find My Friends, Find My Phone, and just trying to flag those apps because in intimate relationships, um, like you're saying, those types of everyday apps have a legitimate purpose, but then can be repurposed. And so when we are working with survivors of intimate partner violence, we're looking to identify all those types of applications because they're misused in these types of cases. So that's how we utilize our tool when we, we started um, a computer security clinic in collaboration with the mayor's office in New York City, um, and we run these clinics at the family justice centers and specifically deal with intimate partner violence. So we're looking at the everyday applications as well as off-store applications um, to identify these cases of monitoring or surveillance. Diana, let, let me ask you, and this is such an important topic and is such a, a scary one as it relates to intimate partner violence. Can you give me a view on how pervasive this is? Is there any way for us to know how big of a threat this currently is, how, how many times it's, it's used or how many of these apps are out there, just the size of, of scope and scale. It's, it's such a frightening problem. I think this is, this is a really important piece of it. Intimate partner violence is a major problem. 
And what we know is that as digital technologies become increasingly pervasive, we're seeing this type of abuse much more consistently. So it's in conjunction with the other types of abuse that are normally associated with intimate partner violence. So um, it's generally 20 or an 11% of men experience intimate partner violence at some point in their life. And within that framework, we're seeing a lot of people also experiencing technology abuse to the extent where people try to leave the relationship and they believe that they have disconnected. But what has happened is, is that they are still being monitored or tracked. And a lot of what we see in our cases is not so much spyware, but it's actually using tools like iCloud, Find My Phone, Google Maps, and having people within the relationship um, know the passwords, have access to that, and then when the person leaves, they're still connected and they don't always realize that. Those are amazingly high statistics. I had no idea. David, I understand that Malwarebytes is one of several organizations that have joined together to establish the Coalition Against Stalkerware, which hopefully can make some big strides in that area. Would you explain to our listeners the goals of this coalition and perhaps some of the ways that users can defend themselves against this threat? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, like you said, the Coalition Against Stalkerware, uh, we launched just last month, and um, it's an effort to pair, like, cybersecurity vendors, like us at Malwarebytes, uh, with domestic abuse networks and online privacy advocates, uh, researchers, and it's all in the effort to protect individuals, right, from the dangerous capabilities that we see in Stalkerware apps. Uh, we're doing this like in quite a few ways. Uh, one is quite clearly here there's there's education, right? Uh, by writing about the ways that these apps can invade privacy, by talking about it like we're doing today on the show, we hope to provide more information to domestic abuse survivors and to users everywhere who could be victimized by these tools, by these invasions of privacy. Two, we also want to define best practices for the cybersecurity industry for dealing with apps that uh, can illegitimately monitor a person's activity. Uh, that means coming up with an agreed upon detection criteria and agreeing to what the term stalkerware even means so we can all move forward quickly when we find it. That's pretty important because for a lot of companies, including Malwarebytes, our software does not ever label these things as stalkerware. Uh, we label it often as monitor, as in, you know, a piece of software that can monitor activity. That's a really broad category, as we kind of talked about before. Um, so it's important to come up with consensus on what is and what is not beyond the pale for, for monitoring. And in Malwarebytes, you know, so much of what we do is based on user choice, information. You know, users have a right to know what's on their device and to choose what's on their device. And, and that belief obviously covers apps that can track what they're doing. Um, and then, you know, back to the Coalition 3, the Coalition Cybersecurity Vendors, we hope to share intelligence with one another that will improve the detection rates of all of our products. It's a sort of lifting tide, rising all the ships. This coalition also hopes to do a lot of, like, understanding from what each expert is bringing to the field. Uh, even though Malwarebytes uh, and me personally, I've been reporting on Stalkerware, I've been writing about it, um, that has not happened in a vacuum. That has absolutely been helped by experts out there, like the experts at National Network to End Domestic Violence, uh, those at Citizen Lab, and uh, Diana as well, you know, at Cornell, um, helping me repeatedly. Everyone has helped repeatedly in my reporting. And so we're trying to kind of formalize that relationship. Well, what can we learn all from one another? As to how users can defend themselves from this, I'm always really cautious to ever give any advice that sounds like a one-size-fits-all approach because particularly for apps like these and particularly for survivors of domestic abuse, there is no single solution. Uh, instead, there's, there's safety planning, uh, both physical and digital, and there's, there's working with advocates. There's understanding that the capabilities of these apps mean that every single search, every phone call, every trip outside, uh, those could be recorded. So for a survivor who lives with her abuser, uh, she may not be able to download any of our applications to scan for stalkerware because the scan itself may be viewed through the stalkerware app, which could anger an abuser. Uh, a domestic abuse survivor who lives with their partner uh, might not have the liberty to have a device passcode on their device, right? Um, we're assuming that everyone has the same level of agency, and, and unfortunately, that's, that's just not true. That's not how it works. So 
for, I think, top-level advice, uh, what I had always learned is contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline from a safe device, you know, from a device that you know is not being monitored or tracked. Uh, these are experts in safety planning, and they are experts in knowing also digital threats, and I think they're the best at it. Diana, let me, let me ask you a question, just, just building on David's comments, especially about how do you help others. I'm just thinking about it myself. You know, we made the theme of RSA Conference 2020 the human element, and one part of that, at least in our thinking, was that there's such a big disconnect between the kinds of things that technology can do and the kinds of things that the users of that technology believe it can do. Like, for example, you know, if my dad takes his iPhone with him to the dentist, for example, he's not thinking or he doesn't even have a mental model of somebody could actually track this. And I'm wondering, how do you think we can help others educate themselves on the kinds of information that they may be giving up just by the act of taking their phone with them or, you know, to David's point earlier about you know, his, his Google searches just in the last couple of days um, and where those might be stored or um, what's being done with them. How do we help folks, especially non-technologists, create mental models for these things so that they can be more aware? Sure. Well, I think um, from a professional point of view, as David suggested, we all need to work together to solve these types of issues. Um, in terms of making the public aware, I think there is a lot of cross accounts, cross devices, and just understanding um, the mental models of, um, especially in intimate partner relationships, of the shared accounts. One thing that we've seen a lot of is as simple as um, shared phone plans where someone might be paying for the phone bill and they can then track your location or see who your recent contacts are. So in terms of educating the public, what we just try to do is, you know, communicate best practices and, you know, we're trying to make people aware when we see them in the clinic just about all the different ways that they are sharing information and we try to go through people's phones and look at all the different configurations such as what iCloud shares, um, how you can see recent logins on your phone into, let's say, Gmail and disconnect devices um, from that. So it's just a matter of sitting down with people one-to-one, -one, but also working, professionals working together as a group to share our knowledge. And we open source all the tools that we create and share them with both professionals and they're available for the public as well. That's some great guidance. My, my mind is just turning with all of the short, medium, longer term needs that are happening here. And, and I love the opportunity that exists in our industry for better sharing of information. Um, that threat intelligence theme uh, was one that we, we'd actually pulled out in our trends document this year because it's it, and certainly applicable here as well. Um, I want to address a question to both of you. We've been talking about spyware concerns on mobile devices, but it's, it's interesting the concern consumer surveillance systems that IoT devices have brought to bear. Uh, it's been a theme in past RSA conference presentations, definitely have some presentations on it this year. I would imagine it will be a theme in presentations for, for years to come because of the pervasiveness that we have here. Um, can you talk to our listeners perhaps about the social and ethical concerns that you believe might be inherent in these consumer surveillance networks? Yeah, yeah, of course. So when you're talking about these, I saw that you mentioned, you know, IoT, Internet of Things devices, um, to just focus on those, right, as a, as a sort of consumer surveillance network. We definitely spot it in a lot of our products, and, and one that I recently looked at is a smart doorbell, right? Um, these doorbells that uh, can tell you when a package is left behind, uh, they can spot when someone walks by or if there's ever any sound. Um, a lot of these are sort of billed as a solution to never losing a package again, right? Um, or, or checking who's at your front door without uh, having actually to get up from your couch uh, or to leave your office. Um, but what a lot of these have become is, like you said, it 
perfectly a consumer surveillance network, a privatized surveillance for your neighborhood. And that's extremely important when you see, again, how revealing the data that's being captured is and, and how easily it can be accessed. Having a device that provides a sort of 24-7 view of what's happening outside of your front door and then assuming that everyone on your block has the same surveillance device uh, is creating a sort of perfect visual map of what is happening at every second of every day. Having that data also not perfectly secured and locked behind uh, proper access is extremely dangerous. Um, and it's happened at at least one company. Ring provided access in its Ukraine office to employees who did not need to be able to see uh, consumer video based from their Ring devices. Uh, executives also had access where they could actually see someone's video based on only knowing the consumer's email address. These are not proper safeguards. Uh, these are not proper cybersecurity protocols, like whatsoever. And this idea that to be able to stop a package thief, we have to allow mass invasions of privacy is just not correct. That's one of the ways we see it in IoT devices. If you're looking at a broader sort of, you know, how important our data is, you know, in the advertising world, it's extremely important. And again, we see, again, improper data access and controls that means that eventually, you know, things about us, uh, you know, our user behavior online is getting into the wrong hands um, because of sloppy controls. And it's extremely unfortunate and we shouldn't have to accept it as the way we interact day to day on the internet. Great. No, really appreciate that. And, you know, those are some scary examples that you cited. I guess a, a final question for both of you. What are the next steps that someone can take? If they're listening to this podcast, if they've read some of your work, if they've read some of David's articles, what would you advise the average citizen to go and do so that they can learn more about this and better defend themselves? I would just suggest from a simple perspective, pay a lot of attention to the passwords that you use um, and how you answer security questions on these types of accounts just when you're setting them up to begin with. So maybe not answering every security question accurately if you have concern about someone guessing your password and accessing your account. So everything from that type of sharing or knowledge to really thinking about shared accounts in your life, um, everything from Netflix, Spotify, and just keeping track of information like that as well as what David said in terms of IoT devices in the home, um, just how those decisions are made about what's brought in a home because sometimes there's just one person in charge of that and not everybody has equal control over those devices. So paying attention to how those decisions are made, who regulates things, control over those devices and just really thinking about that and then for the companies developing these tools, really thinking about vulnerable populations when they are designing these tools so that there are more options for people if they become victims of this type of abuse. Thanks for that. And David, same question. You know, I'm, I'm sure you've advised your, your readers of ways that they can take action. What would you point them to? Yeah, yeah. Um, before that, I, I also just wanted to hit on Diana's point here where she was talking about shared accounts um, and really stress absolutely how correct she is and, and how important it is. I've also presented before domestic abuse advocates, uh, people who work at local like family justice centers. And one of the things we stress to them is that um, there are employees, there are domestic abuse advocates who have to rely on their own personal devices in supporting survivors. And that can be particularly dangerous in ways that we don't even really think about. And one of those is, again, what if you are an advocate who is on a family plan? Uh, what if you're just a modern millennial who has to be on a family plan? I'm on one, right? That's just how it is. I am taking advantage of that every single day of my life. Um, but what that means is if my phone gets lost or if someone knows that I'm on my father's account and they can access my father's account, is there a way for them to see all of the people I support in my capacity? And it's just a thing we don't think about. It's a thing that, you know, there was no malintent of me being on a family plan. 
was, there just wasn't. But again, shared accounts are something to, to think about and to be aware of. In terms of, again, you know, how can people take action or support themselves? If we're looking specifically at people who are suffering from domestic abuse, if we're looking at domestic abuse survivors, uh, again, I, I really stress safety planning beforehand. Um, you have people you can ask for support. Can you communicate to those people from like a safe, non-monitored device? Uh, can you change your social media account's passwords? You know, can you change your device passcode? Are you even allowed to have a device passcode um, in, in your current relationship? And again, you know, can you install antivirus, anti-malware programs on your own device, um, spyware scanning tools like the ones that the folks at Cornell developed? Uh, those are things to first kind of figure out to begin with, and then you can start taking some more steps about, you know, knowing just what is on your phone and what permissions they have. If you know you can create new online account passwords um, from a safe device, you know, do that. And if you can't, a lot of times in working with advocates, I heard that factory resetting or tossing a device is actually what happens a lot because you just have to get rid of that device. So, again, stressing that go to the folks who know this really well. The National Network to End Domestic Violence has dozens upon dozens of resources, and they're extremely skilled on this. And, of course, the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Thank you both for joining us today. Uh, it's a sobering topic. Um, I always try to see the positive, and I feel good about the fact that there's such great leaders in this industry as the two of you. I feel great about organizations that exist. David, you recommended some, some great references for our listeners, as well as the work that Malwarebytes is doing with the Coalition Against Stalkerware. Um, there's an opportunity for all of us in the industry um, to work together to support and help, and then you've also given some great guidance for us as individuals for efforts that we should take and things that we can do short and longer term. So thank you both for taking your time today and also for your tremendous um, leadership and work to protect 